Robert, great to have you on the show. It's been a while, and it's, it's good that we finally got this on the calendar. Yes, now glad to connect, and you know, excited to chat with you today. And, you know, I've uh, been enjoying the series. I've had a chance to listen to some of the, the fun interviews. So, looking forward to chat. You know, what's what's great about the uh, the show is we're meeting just so many great, thoughtful people. It it just it's 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 a shot in the arm of empathy. It's a shot in the arm of just. Um, how everyone is getting together in the time of COVID self-isolation to lift each other. So um, thanks again for being on the show. Thanks for listening to the shows. And you get the sense of the people that we have on. They are people that are always here helping lend a hand. So it's, it's been a great show. Yes, for sure. And, and I think, Rob, one of the things that we always like to start with, at least as we're now coming out of COVID, or at least with vaccines, being able to come out of your house, at least. Mm-hmm. One of the themes that we keep on talking about is what did people do to survive last year, or at least live their best self or try to live their best self. So for you, what were the hacks that you did or learned or tried to live your best self? Sure. And I'm glad to chat about that. You know, I think it's about a year anniversary, and I think we've all been reflecting yeah. on that a bit. You know, there are a number of things and some are, you know, on the one hand, I found that I was really able to appreciate a lot that I'm fortunate to have in my backyard. You know, we live in the East Bay in the San Francisco Bay Area and have a little house and just noticing all the birds, you know, it's kind of a mindfulness in terms of the nature around one. You know, we yeah. always like hiking and exploring nature wherever we can and the birds, the flowers and being able to spend time as a family and you know, with my wife and my son here, we are enjoying all, all those things that are right near the home. I hope that stays with us, you know, as life gets busier after this. So that's been great. Um, you know, I, I've also, on the flip side, I, I started getting back into sailing right before this all started. Oh, wow. Um, and I've always, you know, loved things that involve the ocean. And so I've been reading books about people sailing around the world. So that's the opposite sort of side of things. So people who are more adventurous than I'll likely be, but, you know, some are inspiring to at some point to maybe a, a short cruise or, or things like that. And that's been a way to kind of look toward the future and, you know, indulge things that are of interest. And then I, I think it's, you know, obviously trying to, it's been fortunate in that I've spending more time with my family because I have been doing travel and time before. So this was a nice chance to spend more yeah. time. Um, and I think a lot of people, you know, if there's an advantage to at least being locked down with you know people you love and want to spend more time with, um, that's been helpful. And, and I think just being, you know, self-compassion is probably another thing that just comes to mind. Just reminding oneself, especially there have been sort of phases to this whole thing, right? There's the initial shock, thinking this was going to be short-lived and just not knowing how long this will go. And and trying to remind myself, um, you know, if if I'm juggling things a certain way or whatever, that this is a challenging, unprecedented time. So but those, those are a handful of things. All right. Have you done similar things yourself or? There's so many funny things. Uh, threads here so one there is a bird that wakes up every day and chirps at i think it's 520 or 518 or 519 okay. mother nature is crazy and for, for a punctual bird <laughs> and maybe in a different world it would annoy me but now i have stopped setting my alarm i keep the window open I mean, so what's happened is I kept the window open because of that nice breeze and then the birds chirped. Um, so, but now one of the things I look forward to every morning is a bird that's, I don't know the type of bird. I have not named the bird, but every morning, like mother nature, it just wakes up and it's, to me, it's, <laughs> it's, it's a highlight. And um, so I, I have a connection with birds. I have not taken it to the next level of actually researching the type of bird it's, um, I have not taken it to the next level where I've created a birdhouse, but it's yeah. just um, I've stopped setting my alarm. So that's been mm-hmm. fun. And <laughs> as far as sailing, I have kind of a few questions there. So are you a sailor or you want to be a sailor? How big is the yacht or boat? Sure. Like, And uh, I, I don't have the vocabulary yet of, of that passion. So yeah, teach us, teach everybody. Like, what Sure, I'm going to talk about it. Um, Yes, sailing is more accessible to people of all interest and means than one might think. I've done boating off and on during my life. I used to live on the East Coast for a while and okay. 
would sail like 20 foot keel boats into wow. Chesapeake or Long Island Sound. Out in San Francisco, it's pretty windy. You have these thermals that come in. Um, you know, every, every around two o'clock in the afternoon, some people would describe this as a, as a predictable hurricane. <laughs> so wow. you, you want it's not quite like that, but I've heard that described by sailors. Um, so you you want to be a little bit more trained here, um, but still the boats that I've taken lessons on sailed anywhere twenty four to thirty feet, which is relatively small for a keel boat. Um, a lot of the boats you you know people can get it can be 30, 40 years old. Um, talking a little technical here. I mean, they're, the original fiberglass boats last for a long time. So you okay. can, you know, we don't have a boat. We, you know, thinking maybe of getting one at some point, but you can rent boats and um, they're pretty accessible. And the keels make it so if you get the right type of boat, they're pretty forgiving in terms okay. of the wind won't blow them over. So, but it, you know, you take lessons and it's a, it's a good. It can be very meditative too. I know we're thinking of mindfulness. One thing nice about sailing is that you. You know, you're going along, it seems fast in the water, it's all to be slow, but there are always things to think about and it can be relaxing that way too, because you have to understand the wind direction and things like that. Um, so it's it's a nice mix. Yeah, but of, that's that's yeah. exactly what I like about it. It's yeah. Yeah. for me, I like I like being on the water, I like swimming, I like being in the sure. ocean, or being on the lake. But in times like this self-isolation, sunsets, sunrises a wind on your face for sure that we've you know we've experienced our whole life now for me those are moments that i just i'm just you know they hit a wind breeze hits me i'm like oh this is this is a nice day there's a lot of bad going on but you know look at that sunset wow you know just you know, i'm alive you know i'm on the boat i'm on the water yeah. Like it's a mess at home are you i mean are there days like that in this time where you're just like really trying to soak in that experience because of everything that's going on in it, it just means so much more. Like, how, how do you, in you know, get? How do you take that and just use it as like um, oxygen, air, photosynthesis? How, how do you use sure. it? Yeah, certainly, you know, memories of experiences like that, and then you know, you can step outside and feel the wind and imagine you were on the beach. Yeah, um, we can get to the beach here occasionally, and yeah, for sure, it, it is this mix. I think of being mindful of the immediate pleasant sensations where you're fortunate to have them in nature and allowing yourself to dream about things in the past that are meaningful and things you're going to do, you know, optimistic that we're, I, I feel like we're in the springtime here. I know we're not over this yet, but it's sort of like a renewal season with the vaccines coming, you know, getting excited yeah. about responsibly getting back into things. And yeah, for sure. Um, yeah. It's great to think about this. I, I, and I think you bring up uh, something we, we had an internal meeting yesterday and you bring up a, another point of like springtime and I just, it's, I'm so happy you use that as a word. It, it's um, I like that as where we are in this this COVID process. It does feel like a springtime. It's like you're starting to to think about changing the your closets over. We just set the clocks. <laughs> it's like the warm weather is coming. It's just like you're thinking about barbecues. I've gotten my first vaccine. I'm getting my my second shot next week, and I'm already thinking, when can I not be on a Zoom anymore? I, so for me, I'm already thinking like, oh my God, I think I can maybe count the days between. Maybe I don't have to be on so many Zooms. Or what's going through your mind when it comes to maybe the springtime and and your work and um, maybe less dependency on Zoom? I'm not sure if it's in person, but. What do you, like, I don't have the crystal ball. I don't think anyone has the crystal ball, but what do you think the next six months are going to look like? I'm optimistic. I've been trying to follow, you know, as most of us are, that that's the science, the changing news in terms of planning. Yeah. It, it seems like within a month or two, many, many people will be vaccinated. They seem pretty confident that you can then start getting together and, you know, of course, keep on monitoring those. So I'm looking forward yeah. to, we've been pretty conservative, but looking forward to, you know, fortunately, again, the Bay Area, I think you're in Miami, is that right? I think you're, you've escaped Miami. Okay. Escaped the Bay, East Bay, East <laughs> Bay. I'm an East Bay guy, yep. There you go. All right. I love Miami, too. We'll talk about that at some point. <laughs> but, um, but, you know, we're getting into time where you can still be outside. So I, I, I think still, you know, I'll take this step at a time, but definitely looking forward to seeing people in person, to doing more things, to just looking over one shoulder less, you know, in terms of, you know, am I... Yep too close to somebody, someone or yeah. all that. And, you know, but, but also still being patient with that process. Cause I, I think it's, 
you know, we're still evolving it. But yeah. I, I do feel it coming, whether it's two months, four months. I, I think it's to me, it's very tangible, which is exciting. Yeah, it you feel it. You, you feel it. Uh, you know, when you get the shot and you're waiting for your second shot, like I'm still staying inside. I'm still not going out to eat at restaurants. I'm still doing takeout. Sure. But um, I'm now walking a little. I just think things are, you're starting to get a little bit more comfortable and comfortable. And it's, yeah, for um, sure. And and now I want to move it to, in a weird segue here, to, to a data part of this conversation, right? Because sure. you, sure. you just had an idea here. So we talk about the black box, right? Never, everyone sure. has like a black box, right? So um, if I think about, COVID, I have my own black box of like what I think is my comfort level. It's my own algorithm of maybe where I'll go, what I'll eat, what I'll do. <laughs> but the black box in data science, there's a lot there in healthcare. And I know this is something that maybe we wanted to talk about. So I don't know if you want to pick up that theme anywhere, but sure. you know, healthcare, black box, how we make decisions, um, trends. So what's on your mind when it comes to like sharing sure. some of that expertise with our community? You've got to talk about that. I've spent a lot of my data science career in healthcare, not all of it, but much of it. And, you know, have done enough in other industries and followed it to try to get a sense of what approaches I think are important in healthcare and, and black yeah. boxes. The notion of not having a black box in healthcare, I think is important. And part of what I mean by that is that one can still use very sophisticated approaches. You can use deep learning in, in many different ways. Mm -hmm. um, but it's really important that the people involved trust the algorithm. And there's good reason for that, because we can you can see if you look in the headlines, you follow this every once in a while, someone will create an algorithm where they weren't careful with or been applied, and it'll end up having a different outcome yep. than they thought. And so having been in healthcare, you, even things that are, let's say, relatively more straightforward, let's say regression. You know, some people are very comfortable interpreting regression. Other people, you know, if they're not data people, they don't have the training, they're less comfortable. Um, that's considered more interpretable, you can make it, but there's sometimes you wanna represent the example of regression in, you know, straight correlations and bar yep. graphs. Um, and I, I think it's really important to mix those methods and you don't want to, give up on some of the predictive power where it's appropriate of these different ones, but you really want to educate you. Um, you really want people to understand what's involved and you, you want to balance having a little more precision at times versus something that's truly actionable and trusted because you'll get much more energy there and you actually get more of a, a change dynamic if people trust what you're doing. I'll, I'll pause there, but certainly an, an area of interest. Curious to yeah. You know, it's all that. the the trust trustworthiness is is huge. Um, <laughs> I'm on a IBM show named Social Knot, and we were talking about trust in AI, the trustworthiness, no. the trust in the design of how you build the model, the trust in how you use it. The trust is uh, trust, empathy. Um, I think one of the things that we also want to talk about is is survey, and I think we we go into building models and we want to trust it. And then we could also do other things like surveys and, and ask people. But I think those are also um, interesting dimensions because I still don't know how many people lie on surveys. So I don't know if I take the trust in the algorithm versus the trust in the, uh, you know, like the ultimate survey is, are you happy with your job? Everyone's like, yes, and they leave. No, I, yeah, I understand. And <laughs> And I don't, um, I don't know if we talked about, you know, I did a, a lot of my initial training was in workforce issues, right? And, oh, wonderful. Yeah. And I um, once, I'll, I'll share, you know, I once saw an analysis somewhere where people found this really strong correlation between, um, you know, workplace satisfaction and productivity. Okay. It was, I think, both workplace and customers. And, product, and this is what they expected. And people were sharing this around. And we went to replicate it. And we found that, yes, there was this very strong correlation, but it was in the opposite direction. <laughs> and it, they had miscoded the survey. They would gotten the axes wrong. But because they were expecting it to be so strong, they just went with it. And it doesn't mean that there truly is this negative correlation. But as you know, many people have done research in this area. It's more complex. So you have to be careful. Yeah. And surveys, rightfully, people are skeptical. You know, we don't want to open up a, a different type of box talking about political stuff. But, you know, <laughs> right. we speak. 
we see, you know, yeah, where those point. have gone have gone wrong. But you know, if you hold aside even where those have gone wrong, you know, predicting whether someone votes or not, that's really hard. So if you can yeah. get eighty percent on that in many situations, as long as you're clear on what what the accuracy is, I think that's a really important point too. I think it's really important whatever you're doing algorithmically to be clear about how certain you are that the prediction is working, because that builds trust and that lets yes. you business decision on it for sure. I think that. You know, there, there's so many things there. There is, um, as the data scientist, and this has come up in other podcasts, is you, our job is to build these models to show the output, and then we present it to leadership, and then leadership says, "Well, we can't put that in the model. Let's take that bias out. Let's take this bias out. Let's take this bias out." So, right. you, like, you're right. So it's if you look at trust, um, I think on one side it's all right. Let's put everything in the model and see what it comes out. Just everything everything as a scientist and then i don't know what that trust is when you start taking things out because of rightfully so the risk or the pr risk strict the pr risk alone might not be worth it so i guess it's trust ish it's yeah. you know it's it's trust ish I, I have you seen that where you've put together a model and then leadership or someone has said hmm, that one that data source i don't feel comfortable with let's take that out Definitely getting people comfortable with the data source is always a really important thing. And especially if, if you're telling leaders, I've been in situations where I've been giving feedback to senior leaders about how their performance is in a certain dimension, because that was our job. And you, know, you have some meaningful conversations with them when you, you're telling them you're at the 25th percentile um, compared to others and they're working very really hard. They're not happy to hear that. And so you have to really go through and, and show exactly why the data is valid, show why all the reasons they think this is biased may be true, but everyone else being judged that way is using the same metric. And so, you know, that's very important. And you have conversations and, and anytime someone brings something up, we always think about it, investigate it because there could be a quality issue and it's, yes. it really makes things stronger. Um, but it, when it works well, it, it, there are these interesting back and forth, but that can really make everything stronger. And you just have to have your organization set up to tolerate those, I think. Yeah, I think that's that's absolutely well said. Um, another question about survey for you, if that's okay. Do you sure, believe sure. in, there was, you know, a hundred years ago, <laughs> it was the, the one big employee survey that takes all year. It's like the one, it's like, then this, it has moved to rapid surveys, I don't know what you would call it, instant surveys, and then it moved sure. from um, confidential to anonymous. And what I've learned through this is um, the survey data, at least on some of the employee side, when you don't know who the employee is, it, it's it's sometimes hard to build the impact because it's just, we just got all the information. Um, based on where you're seeing surveys going from one year to maybe daily, hourly, what are your thoughts on on the right way to survey. We even talked, about, there's a lot here. We talked about healthcare and empathy. Can we measure it? Which, when should we survey doctor, patient? There's so much here. So, and that's great data. It is like, we want that. How do you do it without being in, uh, annoying? Uh, how do you do it at the right time where, uh, you know, and how do you get it? So these are things that I'm thinking about. Do you, sure. What are your thoughts? A few thoughts. I mean, I think all those things you mentioned, realize that it is a it is a profession, it's an art and a science. You know, yeah. and I think surveys are one of those things where people think, oh, I can just do this. And you don't want to be paternalistic, but it's very you've seen many times, even just to get a question that's clear, um, and then to have the administration process you're describing done well. Anything, you know, if you change the order of a questionnaire slightly, and and, and political pollsters know this too, it'll change the outcome. So I, I do think you really want to have a professional do it. You want yeah. to take it seriously. It, it's one of those things where you think you can do it. So, you know, how often, um, one of the things actually that this is a slightly different, you know, it's a different issue, maybe I'll riff on this for a second, is that yeah. one of the things I've seen with data science analysts too, you have to be careful about changing your focus operationally too many times. Because if something's not working, people start to think, oh, let me, ask this question, let me analyze this. We must have the the science wrong. Often you haven't given the initiative time to have impact. And so you can have so-called analysis paralysis on the one hand, which you hear about in the world. I don't know what the other metaphor is, but changing too yep. quickly, flavor of the month, things like that. 
is the the flip side of that. So that's one of the you know that's one of the risks I think of serving every month or so because yeah. you haven't given the organization time on the customer side too. Um, the, the other thing I'll, I'll maybe just add it touches on one other thing is one experience I had and I worked at you know Kaiser for a while and I can share some of these things that we you know share publicly that we'd worked with the government on um, developing the survey. We helped to test it, one of the main hospital satisfaction surveys. And there was one question, you know, did the nurse listen carefully to you? Okay. All okay. right. Yeah. Sounds like a straight question. Yes. And um, what we found, and we had, we were a large organization, we had hundreds of thousands, millions of responses. We could yep. analyze all different ways. What was very interesting is the way people interpreted that question was different than the way the patient was. Right. Okay. The way people were interpreting in the industry was like, you know, have you made eye contact? Have you, let's say, repeated what the person said? Right. And when you looked at the underlying government research, which they shared, they do something called cognitive testing, which you're probably familiar with, where you, you nice. ask 10 people just to think out loud when you're answering that question. And what they found is that does a nurse listen carefully to you meant that he or she do what you asked them to do? They don't care how many times you nodded your head or what you did. Like, <laughs> you know, were you back in the room with the painkillers soon, right? And and it it sounds obvious in hindsight. Did you but, interview my mom? Is that who you interviewed? <laughs> did you interview been through there? She had this. Is she you know had that experience there? <laughs> is she a nurse? I don't know. No, no, no. But she's the patient. Did you listen to okay. me? Just, just exact everything you're saying. They don't care about that. Like, give me my meds or give me their thing. <laughs> exactly. And in hindsight, it sounds totally obvious, like many things in science. But that insight, and that was from 10 patients that we were careful to look at what was that initial impact. Um, that really then gave everyone insight into what actual initiatives would have you know, the overall impact you want. And we could put all sorts of metrics around that. And, and that gets back to the trust issue too. If people can understand you know, in language yes. why something, if you can speak to them, then I, I think that's really important. So I'm, I'm passionate about this. I'll pause there for a second. But nah, <laughs> there's so much. I'm glad we dug into that because um, it, I forgot about some of those little nuances of phrasing the question sure and then three questions later asking it slightly different in a different way and um you know one of the things in and just taking this survey conversation um i i mentor first-time founders and i tell them when you're four or five employees survey your organization i know you're only four because yeah. you're going to get funding. You're going to go from five to 15, you three extra company, 15 to 30. Yeah. And these are moments in time where that core four, that core five, you really want to understand that culture. So I also think, um, I don't like the survey fatigue, but I also think it's never too early to survey it, just to get that information, put it in a box, the sure. black box, put it somewhere. We have the data point. Maybe it's for performance. Maybe it's for for roadmap or something, but you do bring up a good point on how you ask the question is as important of just doing the survey. I agree. For sure. For sure. Yeah. And the other thing about um, the surveys of where are you with confidential versus anonymous? Sure. Um, it's a great question. You know, in the healthcare space, the government, there are certain surveys that your patient is. And okay. so that's, you know, um, uh, you know, as I interpret confidential using the same terms that, you know, you know who it is, but you don't share it, you know, versus anonymous where you can't know. And in healthcare, for example, the customer space, that information is extremely valuable if it's handled the right way, because you yes. can attach those survey measures to all different things. You can look yep. at um, health outcomes and there there are associations like all of them are complex. Yep. So I, I think... No matter what, whether it's confidential or anonymous, you want to, I th at least for most audiences, be really upfront about what that means and how it's reinforced. Otherwise, you don't get yeah. the answer. Yeah. And it yeah. sounds like you would think similarly. I, I, I agree. I think that um, my ideal, if I could get my ideal, is is confidential. Yeah. Like, I, I need you to trust that we're going to be adults about your information, but I... I do want to know. I don't want to know because I'm just curious. I want to know because I want to give the right path 
to have you be happy or the right path for the solution or something. So the more I know about you, the more I think I could craft something to you. And I know this is a quick segue, but if you have a few more minutes, oh, yeah, um, sure. this is why I also like giving Google all of my information because mm. the more information I give, the better search I get back or the more yeah. relevant something. I know it's a, it's a rant to connect to other oh, no. thing, but it's like, it's, there is a block box in Google. There is a block box in all these. And yeah, the more information I give you, and if I trust you, yeah, I, the trust is I trust you in two ways that you won't do something with it that I don't agree with. But I also trust you that the results I get are going to be better. Like my newsfeed is highly now tuned to me. The things I'm getting are, I'm delighted. So there is the other part of the trust. So that goes back to, you know, the more I like and delighted when I get things back, the more I'm going to give, right? That's not new. And I just, are you the person that likes to share or are you the person that you personally, or are you like, mm, I, I have, I, I'm not a, I clear my cash as much as I can. Um, it's a great question. It's something I honestly go back and forth with. I know, and I'll, I'll, I'll tie in a little bit the healthcare side directly. And I, I know you had an interesting conversation with a, a woman leader in healthcare analytics who I think you're talking about some of these yeah. issues that, you know, um, you can do a lot of things within the organization with data because of HIPAA, um, even though there's still guidelines how you can use the data, any data, whether it's survey otherwise. Healthcare limits how data is used externally, but um, and it, it's understandable why for privacy concerns, those are limitations, but it also does really reduce, we don't, it's harder for us to leverage big data in healthcare because of these limitations and interoperability issues. And it's something I think we all have to collectively keep on working on it. Obviously it's a probably a good conversation of itself, but I tend to trust institutions maybe slightly above average, but I'm not on the far end and so, you know, much data I give, um, but it really depends on how it's going to be used and who's who are the actors. And so I, I evaluate it myself place by place. And I, I think, you know, collectively in data science, if it's really important for us to continue to build trust on that issue because I agree. I, yeah, because we can learn so much from it if we can link all these data, it's not just in healthcare data sets, but yep. and otherwise, but we have to have people trust that we're doing it the right yeah. way. No, absolutely. Listen, this this has been a, a real treat hanging out with you, and I know we've uh, tried to get this on the calendar, and, and we're going to be spending more time. And one of the things we are as a community, and you hear me talk about sure. this, is we're only as strong as the community thread. Yes, and there are a few people I'd like to introduce you to, but in who do you want to meet? People in sector, people that are studying certain applied math uh, algorithms. Like, who would be the ideal if I can not connect you within our community? What kind of people I, are you looking? I appreciate for? that. I appreciate you doing this this whole process. I think that's really you know helpful on many levels. Well, first of all, I'm glad to meet anyone who thinks that whatever my path has been be helpful to them. So okay. I'm glad to do that. So people earlier in their careers or later. You know, probably you mix it, you know, it maybe some in healthcare, but some definitely outside. I think it's very important to learn from other areas. Um, our current company is doing really neat stuff. Um, you know, Uda Health, where I'm at, in terms of financial side and administrative side. So people in fintech, you know, along those lines, all that, okay. you know, anything along those lines would be helpful. But I'm always, okay. I love to meet people. All right. No, that's great. Uh um, fintech, we, we've got quite a few healthcare, quite a few, and no, that's, that's great. And then my ask of you is we still skew more male than, than female. So as you meet other strong women in tech, sure. Just think about connecting us. Um, I just want us to have a little bit more balance. Oh yeah. And we're still probably like, I think we're now in the, the high sixties percent male, we're not 50 50 but it's not 90 10 right so that's sure. good but um and um yeah so and we're good connecting on on linkedin and i think i don't know what happens once we get through springtime of COVID. i love that line right so i don't know so but the connections will stay okay. and maybe the the community stays together maybe we don't but we got together in this time to break up the self-isolation 
I don't know where the next move is, sure. but um, we'll take it one step at a time. Yeah, no, I'm, I'm glad to introduce you. Froze are a little bit at the end, but I think we oh. heard everything. Yeah. Um, yeah. And uh, yeah, glad to introduce and, and look forward to keeping in touch with the community myself. I hope I hope everyone does. Too. Yeah, definitely. All right. Thanks, Rob. Be safe. Um, and um, thank you. Thanks again. Thanks, my man.